Hello, friends. It's good to have you join us for our continuing study of Revelation chapter 14. We'd like to ask you to take your Bible and open to the last book of the New Testament, and we're going to look specifically at a portion of Revelation chapter 14. We noticed here the final message of God to the inhabitants of earth just prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this message is presented as three angels' messages. The first angel's message we've covered in great detail. The second angel's message we've moved through. And now we are studying the third angel's message. We've looked in previous studies at the beast power that is brought to view here. We've considered the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And now we have come to the serious issue of the wrath of God. In verse 10, God pronounces a very serious warning for those who receive the mark of the beast. Notice it with us in verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Here, friends, we see a very serious statement concerning the final end of those who receive the mark of the beast. And we want to understand, James, just exactly what is entailed in the wrath of God. You know, Ty, many people today, even Christians, misunderstand mm -hmm. the wrath of God. That's right. God here is revealed as pouring out His wrath upon those who have turned away from Him mm -hmm. and spurned His mercy. But God doesn't do this because He takes pleasure in the death of the wicked. In the Bible, we have a description of God's character and it is love. God is love. And His attitude, even toward those who are lost, is an attitude of love. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 18, there are a couple of verses that I want us to read together. Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 23 and 32. Notice what it says here about the character of God. God is speaking and He asks the question, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God? and not that he should return from his ways and live. Verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. God has no pleasure in the death of those that die. God doesn't take pleasure in pouring out his wrath upon the wicked. He doesn't take pleasure in seeing those who are lost suffering. Mm -hmm. from the affliction and the pain that comes to them as a result of their transgression. God doesn't take any pleasure in any of the suffering that takes place upon this earth. God is a God of love, and God's thoughts towards us are thoughts of goodness, not of evil, to give us an expected end. We have such natural misconceptions of the character of God due to our own sin and guilt. We tend to project our own likeness onto God and to assume that He's like us. But the Bible tells us that God is not like us. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. You thought that I was altogether such in one as yourselves. The implication is God is saying to us, I'm not like you are. In James chapter 1 and verse 20, we have an interesting statement that contrasts the wrath of man with the righteousness of God. Uh, James chapter 1 and uh, verses 19 and 20. Notice these words from the Apostle James. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So we have something here in Scripture called the wrath of man. And it seems that James is telling us that the wrath of man is not compatible with the righteousness of God. God's wrath, which is very clearly a biblical subject, there is such a thing as the wrath of God. But it is not like the common human rage, human anger, bitterness. God's wrath is always couched in love. It is a wrath that is righteous, not unrighteous wrath, James. We see that example, Ty, in 
the life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and who exemplified the character of God. There were times, though, in the life of Christ when Jesus did manifest a righteous indignation, we could call it, a righteous wrath. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of occasions when he went into the temple and he saw there the poor being despised and the wicked prospering. He saw deception being uh, manifest there and the selling of the animals for uh, exorbitant prices and the poor um, being taken advantage of because they needed to come to the temple and buy these animals mm -hmm. and seek forgiveness for sins. And, and he saw that his house was not a house of prayer, but a house of buying and selling and merchandise, and wrath, righteous indignation fill the heart of Christ, our Savior, and He drove out the buyers and the sellers mm -hmm. and made place for the poor to come in and to find in the house of God a place of prayer, a place of refuge. But of course, it wasn't a wrath that was born out of some kind of personal offense. It wasn't born out of self-centeredness. Rather, it was a wrath that was revealed on behalf of those who are being taken advantage of, those who are suffering under the cruel hand of others who were capitalizing on their weakness. So again, we see that God's wrath, as it was manifested in Christ, is a righteous kind of wrath. In Romans chapter 1, we have probably one of the most extensive dealings in the Bible with the wrath of God. If you look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. So here we recognize that God is a God of salvation. He is seeking to save those who are lost. But it's interesting that in verse 18, just one verse later, after verse 17, Paul says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we have in verse 16, a God of salvation, and in verse 18, a God of wrath. And these are compatible in Paul's mind. There's no dichotomy. He doesn't see God as schizophrenic, revealing one kind of character one moment and then another kind of character the next. God is a God of salvation, and he is, in fact, a God of righteous wrath. But then Paul goes on and he develops for us an understanding of just exactly what the wrath of God is all about. In verse 19 of Romans 1, he says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So Paul teaches us that God somehow, by means of his Holy Spirit, no doubt, operating on the consciences of men, has revealed himself to all. Jesus, according to John 1, in verse 9 is the true light that gives light to every person who comes into the world. In verses 20 and 21, Paul tells us that God communicates with the human family through nature. Notice verses 20 and 21, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so here, friends, we see that God reveals himself, his character, to every member of the human family through the medium of nature, through the movings of his Holy Spirit upon the hearts of men and women and children. And scripture says that in a sense, everyone encounters God. We know God, but we do not worship him as God oftentimes, and people pursue their vain imaginations. In verse 22, Paul says, professing themselves to be wise, they became...